In the last video, we saw that different observers are having a different experience of time. Events that are simultaneous for one observer are not simultaneous for another. So we need to see what this does for how people measure the time between events. So the classic thought experiment due to Einstein is he was thinking, well, what's the most at least conceptually, what's the best clock I can possibly build? And what he imagined was a light clock. A light clock is where we can shoot a photon of light, a sparkle of light, and have it rattle back and forth between a mirror. Now, how exactly you could read this? A, he was a theoretician. He didn't worry himself about the practicalities of how to read such a clock. But... At the essence, all you need out of a clock is something that reliably goes tick-tock. And certainly the photon going from one mirror to the other is a tick, and then the return trip is a tock. Now, just like we realize that the only way that you can really properly measure the length of something is to require that you measure the x-coordinates of the two ends at the same time, here, to properly measure the elapsed time, we need to look at the when the two events are at the same place. So in what we call the proper frame, where the clock is not seen as moving, um, the photon will make it back to where it started. And we will say that the proper time that elapsed between the two events is delta tau. So. Now that will be equal to the round trip distance, 2d, um, over the speed of light. Okay. Now let's go look at the dilated frame here. So, pardon me for one quick second. So to We'll rewrite this because it'll be useful in a moment. That this distance will be equal to C delta tau over 2. Now, in any other frame where the thing is seen as moving, that would be a, a dilated frame for that object. So here, we're still going to have the same tick and tock. But now notice now that the total distance traveled is different. So if we look, say, at the tick here, um, a dilated observer would have seen the whole clock move a distance v. And here, to be very careful, we'll say the time elapsed here is delta t, which we'll find out is not equal to our delta tau. Um, so our observer who sees this as moving would say, okay, over the length of a tick, we moved V delta T over 2. Alrighty then. So let's go and look at the pieces here. Um, looking at the pieces, whoops, we have the vertical leg, which is held in common, D, that's equal to C delta tau over 2. The horizontal leg here is going to be equal to V delta T over 2. And now, oops, let me do that in orange. bad. So this distance here is equal to V delta T over 2. And then here, this is the tick. The observer in the dilated frame will also swear on a stack of physics books that that light was traveling at the speed of light. So they'll say that this distance traveled is C delta T over 2. 
Okay, so this is where the, I had promised the Pythagorean theorem, and here it comes. So C delta T over 2 is our hypotenuse. That has to be equal to the sum of the squares of the two legs. So that will be V delta T over 2 squared plus C delta tau over 2 squared. All right. So let's just do some algebra for a second here. So squaring through C delta T squared over 4 equals V delta T squared over 4 plus C squared, sorry, squared, squared, squared. That's a parenthesis there. Um, C squared delta tau squared over 4. Now let's see, our first small favor is all the 4's cancel. That's good. Alrighty. Um, <coughs> so let's rearrange this to get all the delta t's on one side, the c's on the other side. So delta t squared and we'll be multiplying that by c squared minus v squared. That equals c squared delta tau squared. Okay, and since what we want to express is the dilated time in terms of the proper time, uh, we'll go through and divide through here. So delta tau, sorry, delta t squared equals c squared over c squared minus v squared, leaving just a bit of space delta tau squared. And now just to make th things closer into standard form, I'll multiply numerator and denominator through by 1 over c squared. So cancel, cancel, and we're going to end up with 1 over 1 minus v over c squared delta t squared. Now let me introduce some notation here. This combination v over c shows up so much that it gets its own special symbol. We let beta, we define beta to be v over c. So then we can rewrite delta t squared equals 1 minus one, 1 over 1 minus beta squared delta tau squared. Now finally we'll take the square root of both sides to end up with delta t equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared delta tau. And once again this combination in front of the delta tau shows up so often in relativity it gets its own special notation and usually gets called gamma. So finally, we can write that delta t is equal to gamma delta tau, where gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. So beta is telling you what percent of the speed of light you're going Gamma, which we'll see, um, we'll eventually see that nothing can go faster than the speed of light, or nothing with mass anyway. Um, but not, and uh, so beta can only ever run from 0 to 1. And if you're massless, then you can go the speed of light and you're a photon. But we won't worry about that for just the moment. Um, so beta can run from 0 to 1. And while beta runs from 0 to 1, gamma will run from 1 to infin whoops, 1 to infinity. So 
The usual way that we remember this is with the mnemonic that moving clocks run slow. If you were to go and look at the seconds ticking over on somebody's uh, cell phone as they're walking, well, cell phone's a bad example because it syncs to a time server. Um, so let's say someone has a watch with a second hand. If uh, you watch somebody walking by and you were to watch very carefully, you would notice that it was taking more than one second for each tick of the second hand. However, in practical life, um, gamma is hardly, is unnoticeably bigger than one. And so we can live our whole lives just thinking it's one. But let's just go and take a look at a uh, bit of an example here. Um, so let's, let's say for instance, that, um, I am moving past you at 0.9 C. So I look on the second hand on my watch, right? And the second hand on my watch is going to tick over one second per second. So now the question is, is this the proper or the dilated time? So think and pause on that and we'll get back. Okay, this would be the proper time interval for the sec for the ticks between the second hands on my watch. So remember, as an inertial observer, I'm allowed to say I am stationary. So you are going to see me moving by. You're looking at the seconds ticking by on my watch, and you're wondering how much time will it take between the ticks. Now, with these relativity problems, what pretty much every physicist does is as soon as they smell relativity, the first thing they do is they calculate beta and they calculate gamma because they suspect they're probably going to need them. So let's go and do that. Beta will be equal to 0.9c over c, cancel, cancel. So beta is 0.9. All right, to get gamma, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. So that will be 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.9 squared. So we can figure that out. That is going to be 1 enter 0.9. Oops. There's 0.9 squared minus square root 1 over. It's 2.29. All right, so we figured out our beta, we figured out our gamma. And then usually what we do is we use this moving clocks run slow thing to figure out whether we need to multiply or divide. Since you're seeing my clock moving, the answer is multiply. So we can go ahead and say, all right, we are solving for delta t. That's equal to gamma delta tau. So 2.29 times one second is 2.29 seconds. And as a practical matter, you have to be moving a pretty good chunk of this, a pretty good chunk of the speed of light for these effects to show up. Um, in almost everything in our practical lives, relativity doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter in, say, the speed of an electron's orbit in an atom. Um, that gets treated that 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 you can calculate that totally classically the only thing that it ever mattered for but doesn't now because of change in technology is if you still see like an old style tube tv line around it, it has to be the color one not the black and white um the way with either kind of tv the 
that the way that the picture got drawn on the screen was electrons were accelerated through an electron gun it would strike a uh, coating of phosphorus on the uh, uh, on the end of the picture tube the phosphorus would excite and then emit the pretty colors with a black and white tv it turns out you don't have to hit the phosphorus all that hard and so the electron was moving at classical speeds however with a color tv it turned out that the phosphor that the phosphorus had to actually be hit pretty hard um, and the electrons actually had to were moving fast enough that the engineers who designed those had to take relativistic effects into account or else um, <coughs> the electrons would land on the wrong parts of the picture too and you would get a distorted picture. But now we all have flat screen TVs that work with either LCDs or LEDs and you're just activating the individual pixels right at the spot so we don't worry about that anymore. The new application where we do have to worry about it and actually several other relativistic effects as well um, turns out to be uh, global positioning satellites. Um, the satellites are moving and because they're moving um, that affects the rate at which um, we me the rate at which uh, we measure the ticks of time being sent out from the GPS satellites. Um, and since we have to solve, since the way global positioning works is we use the speed of light delay to figure out how big of a, what, how big of a sphere, how far away we are from the satellite, we know for a particular satellite that we have to sit on the surface of a sphere. If we can get four of those spheres to intersect, then we know exactly where we are. Um, and it turns out that here, because the distances are so short, the, uh, rel um, the, the small, different, small inaccuracies in the time can lead to huge GPS errors, and so relativistic effects do have to be taken into account. This isn't the only effect, but it is one. And this has been experimentally verified. Um, back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, researchers would take atomic clocks, put them into airplanes, and fly them around for a very long time before landing them and comparing it to an atomic clock that was left on the surface of the Earth. And sure enough, the difference in the reading of time uh, corresponded to this whole moving clocks run slow thing. Now, another very important additional caveat. This is not like some sort of an illusion or something. This is not some funny thing that's specific to clocks. The different observers are having fundamentally different experiences of time. And this affects absolutely everything that you could use as a clock. It, it affects the, if you're to look at the rate at which electrons are orbiting in your atoms, um, you would see a moving person's electrons all moving a little slow. You would look at their uh, heartbeat and you'd think their heartbeat was running a little slow. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. They're, since they're entitled to say that they're standing still, they'd see me moving. Wouldn't they say that everything in mine's running slow? And the answer is yes. We'd both say that it's running slow. This leads to a thing called the Twins Paradox, which will resolve in the next video series, so hang tight on that one, please. So we've already realized that we're having different experiences of time. And since we're having different experiences of time, remember we were saying that then we had to give up simultaneity and in order to measure the length of something, you have to have simultaneous events. We should expect that we disagree on lengths of things as well, because we are also having a different experience of space, and that would be correct. So we'll go back to another one of our thought experiments involving high-speed trains here. So again, here I am. Um, 
on my train moving again at a substantial fraction of the speed of light. All right. So <coughs> let's go ahead and uh, so I, I'm moving by and you again looking at this are stationary. So, oops, my little stick figure person just keeps getting worse. Let's try this again. There we go. So you're looking at me going past your position. So we can both try to measure the speed of the train or well in my case I would be measuring how fast you're going past me but we'll start with you so you imagine sticking like one of those orange traffic cones or something alongside the train tracks and what you'll do is you will start the uh, your stopwatch when the front end of the car goes by and you'll stop it when the back end of the car goes by okay so how fast would you say I was going you would say that I was going at C oops not C V equals what you would measure the length of the box car to be, we'll call that L, and that is a dilated length because you're seeing me moving. However, the time between the two events were both measured at the exact same position, um, namely, namely the traffic cone. So you would divide that by the proper time between the events. All right, what would I do? What I would do is I would say, well, I know the length of my boxcar, it's L naught. And what would happen for me is I would be seeing the traffic cone go from the front to the back. So I would be starting and stopping my stopwatch when the starting it when the traffic cone crosses the front of my train car and stopping it when it crosses the back of my train car that's going to be a dilated time so this is my proper length here okay so what do we have so we have that the dilated length over the proper time is equal to the proper length over the dilated time because they're both measuring the, the speed. So that's going to be the um, diet, sorry, the proper length over gamma times the proper time from what we found before. So what we get is that the dilated length is equal to the proper length over gamma. This will always be less than or equal to the proper length. So the moral of the story here is moving meter sticks are shorter. Look, uh, moving meter sticks are shorter. And again, I can't emphasize enough, this is not some illusion. It's not that one's right, the other's wrong. They are flat out having different experiences of space. One of them measures the meter stick, the, uh, one, one of them measures some object, the other one measures the same object. They will disagree about the length. And if you think about it, that makes some sense because when I measured the uh, 
Um, when, when you, when you, uh, let me try this again. When you measured the length of my box car um, by saying that it's V delta tau, um, you did not measure the front and back end at the same time. So we should expect that these lengths differ. But this is indeed the length you measure for me. And so you would see me being squished. So now an important caveat here. Um, with this squishing, the squishing only ever happens in the direction of motion. So let's say I have a cube like so, and it's moving at some substantial fraction of the speed of light. What you would observe, and notice carefully I said observe, not see, is that it would be squished only in the direction of motion. Now what you would see would be even weirder because the light from the back side is going to take longer to get to you from the, than from the front side. So the front side will be further, what you see from the front side will be further along than the back side. So for what you see, it's going to be some sort of horrendous curved thing that I don't think I can really draw very well, but I'll try. Um, Something like that. So this is what you'd see, but after you corrected for all the speed of light propagation delays and everything, this is what you would observe. Or if we're using the framework of the really small people that I mentioned in a couple of videos ago, this would be the collection of all the really small people who reported at a particular time that the box was, that they were in, currently inside the box. And this would be a plot of all the really small people who said, yep, the box is here. Okay, so this actually is a very useful result. It solves a very important problem for us. Um, and that is, again, that physics has to be consistent. So one of the problems that this resolved was a puzzle involving a special subatomic particle called a muon. So let's talk about how you make a muon. Muons get made typically because some super duper energetic event happened somewhere in the galaxy and eventually some particles just came screaming in at extremely high speed striking our upper atmosphere. These particles get the, for historic reasons get the name cosmic rays even though they're really a particle. They strike in the upper atmosphere, um, a good typical distance for this process is maybe about 10 kilometers up, roughly. And in interactions with the atmosphere, you wind up making one of these particles called a muon. They come in both positive and negative flavors. Let's just say this one is negative, just to think about something. Now what a muon is, is it's like an electron. It's like an electron in every regard except two. One, it's a lot more massive, and two, it's not stable. In fact, the uh, half-life of a muon is 1.5 microseconds. So what that means is if you made a whole collection of muons and then you waited 1.5 microseconds later, you would have half that population. Another 1.5 microseconds later, you would have half of that half or a quarter. Another 1.5 microseconds, you'd have half of that half of that half 
or an eighth and so forth. Okay. So if you do the math on this, um, this means that the number of muon, the, the percentage of muons that live for at least 2.2 microseconds is about 36%. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that if you work it out, 10 kilometers, even with a particle moving at darn near the speed of light, a good typical speed for these muons would be something like 0 0.998 times the speed of light. Even if you work out that, you realize that there are an awful lot of 1.5 microsecond periods uh, be going on here. Let's just do the math on that real quick here. So, if we're going at speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We're going at 0.998 of that. So, <coughs> 299,400,000 meters per second, roughly. We have to travel 10 kilometers, so one over that times 10,000 meters. And what we get is about 33 microseconds. Now, if I divide that by 1.5 microseconds, we see that that was 22 half-lives. All right, for the grins, let's raise two to that power. Um, yike. So we would be down to one, oops, then one over. So we would be down to something like 0.2 millionths of the muons that got made in the upper atmosphere, which means that for all practical purposes, we shouldn't be detecting these muons at all, but we do. So how do we resolve that? Well, um, let's start by seeing um, how, by doing the time dilation to say, well, okay, let's look at these muons that live for 2.2 microseconds. How long would that be in the Earth's frame? Okay, so in the Earth's frame, let's go ahead, calculate beta. Okay, 0.998c, divide by c, cancel, cancel, it's 0.998. Calculate gamma, that's 1 over 1 square root of 1 minus, ooh, um, square root of 1 minus beta squared. So gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0 0.998 squared. All right. 0.998 squared, change sign, 1 plus square root, 1 over, yeah, about 15.8. Now notice I'll keep the number in my calculator just to be a little more careful, but we can roll with 15.8 here. All right, so we know that moving clocks run slow. So our proper time in the question is 2.2 microseconds. We're looking for the dilated time. So it'll be gamma delta tau. So this will be our 15.8 times 2.2 microseconds. Alrighty. righty. 
that works out to be 34.8 microseconds. Hey, that works out pretty good. Um, so it looks like about a third of our muons, a little over a third of our muons, are actually going to make it to the surface of the Earth thanks to the fact that their clocks are running slow. But how does the muon explain it? To the muon, that particular muon is only going to live 2.2 microseconds. So somehow the it has to strike the detector in that amount of time as it sees it. But in the muon's perspective, whoops, the muon is just sitting there minding its business when suddenly Here comes the Earth, screaming up at it at 0.998C. It blinks into existence when the upper atmosphere strikes it, and then eventually, for a third of the population, they'll live long enough for the detector to strike it. But, let's, but the only way that's going to happen is if this distance is kind of short. So let's figure it out. L is going to be L naught. Our proper thickness, remember our, our proper length is 10 kilometers over gamma. So this is going to be 10,000 meters over 15.8. That works out to be 632 meters. So from the muon's perspective, yeah, it only, that particular muon only lived 2.2 microseconds, but since the Earth's atmosphere is only 632 meters thick, we only needed, we, we, we didn't even need 2.2 microseconds before the, for the detector to run up and collide with the muon um, after it blinked into existence when the upper atmosphere collided with that cosmic ray. So the two of them have to go together um, in order for observers to fully explain what each other is seeing. Length contraction and time dilation are both a thing. And with that, I'll catch you in the next one.